Do the airport care about people? No, airports are supermarkets for aeroplanes. I don't believe the customer's always right, but you've got to remember to some extent that most people traveling are quite reasonable. They want to be treated reasonably yeah. and intelligently. So let's talk a little bit, Fred, because obviously you've got all that history in travel and all that great knowledge and experience. And it's been quite a turbulent time over the last couple of years, in particular for the, the travel industry, you know, global pandemic. Oh, gosh, I mean, yes. We've been through so much, haven't we, with 9-11, ash cloud. I mean, there's so many, you know, yeah, now so the, many now shocks. We've got war in Ukraine. And of course, of that, we, yeah. we have the situation in Ukraine, which is absolutely horrendous. Um, if I was to say to you, what, what, what are your thoughts about the future of travel, the future of aviation? How do you think the industry is, is going to move forward? To, to survive? To survive and then to, and then to continue to flourish. Because travel and tourism, it does account for 10% of global GDP. Well, it's, it's the biggest business in the sector. world, isn't it? Yes, really. Um, but of course, it's been tough. And we've got all of these external um, factors to take into account. But what, what would be your thoughts in terms of the future of travel and the future of aviation? That's a very good question, and, and I honestly wish I knew the answer, but I, I can tell you some of the answer, yeah. because I don't anybody has the complete answer. If no they crystal do, ball. <laughs> if they do, we wouldn't be sitting here, would we? <laughs> we wouldn't be there. But I think people, like, well, let's take British Airways, for example. They, they don't know what they're a legacy carrier. They've turned into a hybrid carrier, which is sort of low cost and full service. And once they brought out where you had to buy your bloody sandwiches on board, that became low carrier, and that was Mr. Cruz. And it took away... British Airways had never been the best carrier. But for me, it was a home. Mm. I was used to the colours, the people I knew. I always knew some... And still to this day, I always know somebody that I'm flying with. And they want to come and say hello. Even from the flight, they hello, Fred, how are you doing? They sit down and talk to me, you know? But I think that's what British Airways was to me. Um, wasn't so much about what they did on the ground or in the offices, it was the flight. Um, I used to like flying on the VC Turner down, down to Africa. And then I flew, I flew on, on everything from a DC-4 to a, 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 a 717, which was Stratocruiser, a Constellation, which looked like a fish, Britannia, Comet, uh, DC-8, DC-7, DC-6B. I mean, I've been on all this lot. And it's, it's a matter now of how legacy airlines are going to perform. P people like British Airways and American carriers will never, never compete now with, it, with the Middle Eastern airlines. They, they can't because they I don't care what they say, the, the Emirates, and I know Tim Clark quite mm. well from when, it, when he was at BCAL, but they can just go and afford to buy 3380s. Mm. Nobody in their right mind would do that because they're a money loss, loss leader now. And no, only British Airways, I think, is fine, two of them still, but they got rid of the best one, the 747. Mm. To me, I love 747. I think it was a brilliant aircraft and it divides all the way through. Um, but people have got to adapt to how people are treated on the ground. I mean, you go to check in. And you've got security chains and half the immigration desks open when you come in. People have got to be able to move smoothly through check-in. Mm. Not miss flights because there's not enough staff on to take them through the check-in. Or in the case of Heathrow, it's the highest ticketing point in Europe. Three quarters of the ticket is made up of charges. And now they charge you five pounds to drop somebody off. What is it that they're so greedy that they have to do this? And even if you go and park and drop somebody off, you've got to pay money into a ticket machine. So mm. until they realize that they're killing the goose that laid the golden egg, because the goose that laid the golden egg is a passenger. Mm. And, and, and the holiday maker is a big extent but business travel is still what it's about. And you can have as many Zooms as you want. To me, a Zoom is okay if you've already done business. To set up a business meeting 
on a Zoom. Mm -hmm. There's no atmosphere. Mm. There's no real sense of commitment or feeling. Connection. It's not there yeah. as a face-to-face -face is. And now people are sick to death of Zoom. They mm. want to be face-to-face. -face. Mm. So all half the flights are cancelled or they miss the flight because of the, 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 the check-in. And now everybody gets to fast track. So fast track is probably busier than the normal line at some times. It, mm -hmm. it just needs reorganizing to, to make, I think the onboard experience is, is okay. Yeah. Um, you, can't, you can't do much about that, but now they've got premium, premium economy, business class, oh my God, it goes on. But when they cramp the, the seat pitch down and they cramp the seat arm down to 15 inches, I mean, it's just impossible to sit in something like that for eight or nine hours. Mm. So they've got to overcome their greed. I can understand through the pandemic, they've got to make up for lost ground, but they can't make it up for the people that are paying them. It's not their fault that the pandemic. I think they've got to provide better service. Mm. Um, stop handing out nuts as a meal or buy something. And it's buying it on the ground and there's a package ready when you board it. Well, it's, 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 it's taking the mickey, really. Mm. So where's it going? Until, until the whole thing is now streamlined and people can check in in peace and not miss flights because of the ludicrous going around in chains. Yeah. Um, even coming in and there's nobody there, they will make you go around in chains. And I said to one guy there one day, I said, look, I have a problem breathing. I, I suffer from COPD. I said, could you just undo this so I can walk, walk to the desk? There's nobody here. You go around, he said. I said, are you stupid or what? Why are you making me do this when it's just, uh, he said, you're racist. I said, no, I'm not racist. You're just stupid. I don't care what color you are. You're stupid anyway, whether you're black, brown or Chinese. I said, you're stupid. He said, I can have you block coming in here. I said, well, I, that might be your worst nightmare if you try that. And the, the border control went up to him and said, you shouldn't talk to him like that. You're wrong. I heard the conversation. So I allow him to pass through. But you see, again, you put a uniform on somebody mm. and they become in charge. And again, they've got to remember, I don't believe the customer's always right, but you've got to remember to some extent that most people traveling are quite reasonable. And they want to be treated reasonably yeah. and intelligently. Mm. I mean, I've been on inaugural flights where the guy's in shorts and puts his feet up on the seat in front. And I said to him, have I got to sit and watch your airy legs? Mm. I mean, have some respect. I dress to travel because when I traveled and started flying first class, if you didn't have a tie and a jacket on, they wouldn't put you in. Mm. Mm. You might say, well, that's a bloody cheat, you pay for the ticket. But it's, they maintain the standard. And I still maintain that standard because the girls on the flight, and the guys, they're dressed properly. Mm. I think the least I can do is to be respectful. Yeah. And I always dress properly. And to me, to leave even the tie off these days, I'm very old fashioned. <laughs> I mean, the tie's gone out, hasn't it? But to me, to dress properly is the way I am. Well, it's your brand, isn't it, as well? It's what you, the message you give. Well, well of course it's it is. Your absolutely, brand. you're right. Yeah. Yeah, Look absolutely. at you. Again, I draw attention to the way you dressed last night and now. It's a matter of your own personal pride and protection. Mm. I mean, my friends are scruffy, but we laugh about it because <laughs> that's what they are. They told me you can't come dressed out with us dressed like that. <laughs> and yes, I'll change. Uh, but when I'm doing business, I'm business attired. Yes. Because people know I'm serious. Sure. And, and it's about being serious. Let's laugh about it, but be serious. Mm. So that you, you, people want to know you're for serious and you can do what you promised mm. or do what you set out to be. Airlines need to sort this out. I mean, they really do. Or else they will continue to Zoom. Mm. And, and, and we'll get more packed and packed and packed aircraft like a sardine can, and it'll be more Ryanairs than there are legacy carriers. And, I, and, and people say to me, have I flown? Yes, I've flown with Ryanair, and I've flown with EasyJet. Actually, I think EasyJet are not bad. Um, the way the ground handles with EasyJet sometimes, I flew from Toulouse the last time. 
It's absolutely lashing down with rain. Instead of bringing the plane to the gate, it was 11 o'clock at night. There was no other thing about. They made you go down some concrete steps at the back, across the tarmac, and onto the aircraft. Now, I'm boarding first, so I'm sitting at the front, so they give me the pink paper garbage sack to put over me because the rain is coming in. So I'm sitting in the pink garbage sack in the front seat, but I'm watching the luggage sitting out here, and my friend is travelling with me, and he's got soft-sided luggage. By the time he gets it back, it's flooded. Mm. And I said to the crew, who stuffed their jacket in there, and now he pulls this ruffled jacket out, and I said, you know, why don't they pull up to the gate? There's kids standing on the steps in this rain. He said, I don't know, he said, perhaps EasyJet won't pay for it. But does it, does it really take much in this sort of inclement weather to pull it to a gate? Where's the airport? Do the airport care about people? No, airports are supermarkets for aeroplanes. Have you flown out of Gatwick recently? I haven't recently, not so well, I, since I tell pandemic. you what, even before the pandemic, oh, yes, they, yeah. run, they run you this gambit. It's like, a, it's like running a Russian roulette. You're going through this gambit of people standing there to grab you to sell you something. And I won't buy anything at all at Gatwick. Yeah, you're, you're, you're lucky to get away your head going through this lot. <laughs> so I think the message is around cust about it being a, a seamless customer experience that's enjoyable where you take the friction out, isn't it? Of course it is, because, absolutely. It's know, a fantastic... That, in, uh, that's yeah. the key, isn't it? That's the key. And, and you know, you've been to 70% of the countries in the world. It's probably more than that now, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, 139 countries. I've been 139 countries, something like 150 countries. Yeah. They keep now inventing more countries, so it's difficult. But, um, yes, and I've not just been through the airports. No, you've actually been, been on the there. ground, yeah. So uh, of that, Kenya is your favourite, I think. Oh, absolutely, because Kenya, for me, is the best climate in the world, it has the nicest people I've ever met. Generally, people are very nice in Kenya. The food is fantastic. The hotels are great. The game parks are beautiful. They're unlike South Africa, where the lions come and, and you can feed them. Mm. You mean the Masai Mara and, and Savo? Savo, I took people last, last October, November and December, it's about the same size as Wales. But there are no fences to the game parks. Mm. And at night, the Ascari, the police, it's easy to attend because he knows if there's a, something might eat you on the way. You don't, they don't want to lose anybody. Mm. But again, it's because of attitude, I like it. Mm. People are really pleasant. My little guy there, Joseph, when I stay at the... Karen Bliss in Coffee Gardens in, uh, in Nairobi, he says, Mr. Fred, he brings my coffee to me every morning. He knows just how I like my coffee. <clears throat> can I talk to you? I said, of course you can. You're talking to me. Yeah, what do you want to talk about? He said, no, I mean, can I write to you? I said, there's my email address. And he writes to me and I answer him. And he said, because why not? I've made a friend. And he says, God be with you, and he wishes me and blesses me every day, this guy now. And then I know the president. And I know the head of the airline there, and I know this, this, and the other. And, and I say, I know, I know, I know. But the, what I'm trying to say is, I talk to everybody the same. Mm. I don't have an arrogance or ego problem. I'm Fred. And I'm Fred to everybody. And I, I'm not formal. I'm professional. But Fred is my name. Why shouldn't I be called Fred? You know, I, I don't, and, and I like it when people, I, and I don't think it's an informality. For me, it's a sign of, of we know each other, and it's a sign of endearment. Yeah. As I see it. So Joseph is a friend of mine. Mm. And because I'm doing this, I said, well, oh, they took me to a place last time, to a village, where this lady had done a green thing. With, she'd planted trees and everything. And I met the daughters, and, I met, and it's miles from anywhere on a dirt old track. But I went. And then the head of a, um, Kenya Tourism, uh, Betty Radia, Dr. Betty Radia, she said, we're going to do a fireside chat. So I put a suit on. The next thing I know, I'm in a game vehicle, driving through Nairobi Game Park, doing a, in a suit, <laughs> doing a game drive, doing an interview. <laughs> And then they're dressing me up like a Maasai, but that's, that doesn't matter. 
Yeah. Because it's a it's a it's something that you would never do. Mm. I went to a chieftaincy ceremony in Lagos, in in, Ken, in, uh, in Nigeria, in Enugu country, and it went on for three weeks. But the, 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 the Lincoln Continentals and helicopters, arm, amulets of uh, coral, costing two hundred thousand to put on, mm. stacks and stacks of Dom Perignon. Champagne was banned in Nigeria because they spent too much revenue on it. But there it was, and my friend Godfrey, he said, take it. I said, Godfrey, Star Lager will be fine for me. And then there were little eyes peering out the bush. I said, why don't you, fit? They're, they're throwing food away. I said, why don't you give it to these guys? Yeah, but then they'll come back. I said, so what? If you feed them enough, they won't have to come back. Mm. But uh, there's, there's a, a leveling thing there too, you know. I, I'm not going to say racist because that'd be wrong. But there's definitely a class system mm. that says you don't mix with these people or that yes, people. Yeah. I know there's a big class system in the UK and my accent is not quite right for them. So, mm. I mean, you won't believe I'm sitting on Concord one day and I'm, I'm walking, talking to people who I haven't seen. And some guy from British Airways came up to me and he said, he said and my dear chap, he said, how can you afford to fly on Concord with pencils and stuff? I said, well, is that any business of yours? How are you riding on it? Are you on a, your staff member, yeah? Yes. I said, well, I'm paying your wages, young man. So you just don't talk to me in such a dis disrespectful manner. You, you wish me well or good morning or, or don't bother. Mm, mm. And I said, I don't need your lip. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're right. I mean, standards and, and your brand and the way you carry yourself is, is, you know, it stands out. It does stand out. And you know, when you, th when, you know, you've been to 70% of the world. Yeah. Is there anything on your bucket list, Fred, that you, countries well, that you haven't been to? Well, I haven't been to North Korea, to? but I'm not desperate. <laughs> okay, apart from North Korea. But if you, if you were thinking around, you know, is there anywhere in the world that you haven't been that you really want to go to? No. There isn't. I, honestly, not. I, I'm so... Um, happy to go back where I know I'm going to be loved and respected when I get there. Mm. And Ukraine is my favourite place as well. Ukraine is a very beautiful country. It's, when I go to Ukraine, it reminds me of my childhood in Kent. Everybody's got an allotment and a garden. My mother-in-law, she only comes up to my waist and she feeds three families from this garden. She waters it with a bucket and a well that my father-in-law, when he was alive, built for her. And I was the only English guy living in this town, but they looked after me. I started making, uh, my other hobby is barbecue. I make my own sauces and I cook corporate barbecues for people in America. Now I did it in Ukraine. And I took, oh, this is story. I took a barbecue, you know, a big Weber? Mm -hmm. And I called my friend Anatoly at the airport. I said, Anatoly, I've got a rather big box. He said, how big is your big box? I said, it's very big. He said, don't worry, we'll take care of it. So I'm into the airport, it's on here, and my bag, I'm looking around. And I get to the check, they said, not even you can do this. I said, just going to pee and now. Oh, OK, take it over to the big baggage. My biggest worry was what would happen when I get to Ukraine with this big box. So I, I land and I pick it up and I'm going through and a guy ran up to me, Mr. Fred, it's Senator, I'm head of customs, so thank you what you do for Ukraine, follow me. And we had to take it apart to get it in a four by four to get it home. <laughs> and it was October and we, we, the, we did a barbecue for the head of the prison there and on by the river in his sauna. And so you can make friends and relationships wherever you go. I think Nigeria, I used to get gold plated silver dollars. And if my driver was good. I said, look, there's a Jimmy Carter, he's, he's very popular there. I said, see, this came directly from Jimmy Carter, and I'm going to give you one if you do this. I dare go back there because all the bloody gold has run off by now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the way it is. Yeah. <coughs> and I took a guy called Christmas with me from Export Direction. He was called Christmas. When I left, he went to the hotel and everything was gone because they borrowed the uniforms and wheeled in and wheeled all this stuff out. All right. Um, I knew the chief, <coughs> it's okay, I knew the chief that owned the hotel, it was Holiday Inn, but it had nothing really to do with Holiday Inn, 
He lived on the 12th floor, so I always lived on the 12th floor because I got electricity, water, water and air cooling, you know. And, but when I booked in, they said, you're not the right Mr. Finn. I said, phone up Chief Tosumo and, tell, and he'll tell you. Oh, you are? Okay. And I go to the room, there are two people sitting in it. And what are you doing? We're looking after your room, sir. And doing, we think we were better off doing colonial time, sir. <laughs> I said, I'm not starting into that, you know. <laughs> that's <laughs> another topic. No, that's what I used to say, yeah. Oh, I would. It was, um, but I, I turned Nigeria, I, can, I know how to shake the hand. There's a way you shake hands with the West Africans. And once I do that, they know I've been there. Mm. But even, you can make it enjoyable. Because it's up to you. It's not the best, it's not my favourite place at all. But you can make it into a good place for you with your attitude. Yeah. And you might as well, because I have to go there for work. So I, I made sure it worked. Mm. And, and I, I just had a message from somebody from Ukraine who decided to do this on her own. She didn't consult with me at all, fine. And she's in West Molling in Kent. Well, there's not a lot in West Molling, but it's a very charming little pl place. Mm. And she said, oh, I'm depressed, she said. I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm going to get a job. I, I, I'm lost. I said, Olga, you're away from the bombs. You're away from the bombs. You didn't ask me. I asked you to let me know when you're moving. She was a PR lady from a hotel, mm. a five-star hotel. She was very good at the job. So she thought she'd just move. She didn't need to discuss with me about this, that, and the other. Mm. And now she's in, stuck. I said, I can't help you now, you're with a family, what are you going to do? Oh, I don't like it, I think I'll go back. I said, well, sort yourself out, think of where you are, Maidstone's 25 minute bus road, there's a lot of hotels around there and you'll find yourself a job. I can introduce you, but right now your attitude, I can't introduce you right now, your attitude's wrong. Mm. You've got to be, I'm here, I'm glad, my two daughters are with me away from the bombs, they won't get raped, I'm here. So that's what you've got to think. Once you start thinking like that, and I tell you, every time I move to another country, I wonder where I was. Do I like it here? Do I? And eventually, you know what? You, you start to look for things that you can do or mix with or do, and it becomes a place that's okay. Mm. You, could, you can easily have a doggy in the manger attitude and say, well, I'm not going to like this. The thing is, then you never will. Yeah, what you look for, you'll find, won't you? You will. It's, you, 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 yeah. As somebody said, you, 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 you take out what you put in. I said, but you actually put in a lot more than you take out in most times. Mm, but this is my attitude to go into a foreign country. I'm always re re cognizant that I'm a guest there to start with. So I obey local laws. Nobody held a gun to my head to go there. If I don't like the local laws, get out. It's yeah. as easy as that. Yeah. So it's what I do. Brilliant. Gosh. So much, Fred. We could talk for hours and hours. I know. It's a, it's a, I, I, I tell <laughs> you what. There's a lot to cover. There's yes, a lot to you know, cover. It, it's a fact. <laughs> because it's 63 years. Yeah, it's a long time. And perhaps we'll do another one. We may, Well, I think we'll definitely be doing another one. Because I'd like to do that yeah. one. Because you're, you're an outstanding interviewer, but you're not, better than that. I feel absolutely a chemistry and confidence with you. I, I feel I can let everything go. Absolutely. No, that's good. And it's been a... I, Listen, this is not me saying how, how wonderful <laughs> this lady is all the time, but I just feel good with you. Yeah, I really, really do. And thank you for having me. It's been a wonderful experience. We've got to keep in touch. We've got oh to do things. Oh my gosh, you know? that's it. You see, I know, I know where you live. I've got your phone number. There you go. There you go. Yeah. But before, we, before we finish, I've got some more, some more questions. Oh, well, please go ahead. I'm, I'm sitting here till you want. I've I'm got happy. a few more questions for you. So, you know, when you, you look back at over, your, over your kind of illustrious life in travel and business and relationships and the whole shebang, really, can you, there's been lots of highs and lows. Yeah. But if you had to pick one highlight, of a real standout moment from all of those those amazing people you've met or the places you've been. And it's really difficult to do this, but can you think of a, a standout moment or standout place? Apart from apart from Kenya, you can't say Kenya. Uh, I think I think the standout moment in reflection mm. is what started me off to travel. Moving from Kent. Because mm. if I stayed in Kent, I'd have been a cricketer. And then I do what most cricketers do, where they become a coach or look for a job 
or hope they were good enough, a job comes to them. So perhaps it was fortuitous, looking back, that my father decided I wasn't going to be a cricketer. In the end, I did play professional cricket, and I played with, with world famous, I talked talk with the International Cavaliers, with Gary Silvers and Lance Gibbs and oh. Rowan Canai, all of these good, uh, Jeffrey Boycott's a lifelong friend of mine. I uh, got David Gower's honeymoon for him in Kenya. He called it an INTNT intense romance, <laughs> arranged by Uncle Fred. <laughs> but so th these were high. high well, some of the people I've met and some of the work I've done for those people, some of the cricket players I've actually played in the same team where my heroes, I've shared a room with Jeffrey Boycott, where we're, and I'm actually, he's actually three months younger than me. I was at his 40th birthday party, I ended up washing up the bloody dishes. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Yeah. But it, it just shows you actually quite human, really, doesn't it? Absolutely, of course. Um, but meeting people like that, flying with the red arrows, I mean, I thought to myself, they did it because I was a Battle of Britain baby. And then I, then I became an honorary red owner. I had, you never have a red uniform, only they have to qualify. Do you know they have to qualify each year? Oh, no, I didn't know. Each April they, in Cyprus. And if they pass, then they get the red uniform. Until then, it's blue. Mm. All the engineers that fly with that particular are blue. So I had Fred Finn, red arrow, and my blue uniform. So I was very proud. Mm. And I went to end the term dinners, and then I did the, f and I took David Gower, no, Red, no, no, I took Richard Branson to fly with the Red Arrows, and he made it through the whole display. I was very surprised. And then I wrote his experience for the Red Arrows brochure, and then the same guy that flew me with the Red Arrows, I took on my 10 million mile trip with his wife, on Virgin Atlantic, that was, to, to Los Angeles. And then he flew me on the Phantom. And I took Ron Dennis from McLaren, because I thought he'd like to know about real speed. <laughs> and David Gower, because he got banned from England captaincy for flying around Melbourne in the Tiger Moths, which was the first aircraft I ever flew in, by the way. Wow. I'll tell you that, this is a, these are highs. So knowing these sort of people and, and doing things like the President and Marriott, doing things for them, that seemed quite normal to me, but for them was something out of this world. These, the heights of these people in their profession mm. could press the button, probably got it, but they didn't. They came to me. So I was able to facilitate them. And yes, so there's that. Now, my first ever flight, I was, what was I, 13 years old? And I used to go on my bike to Lyd Airport. Now Lyd was, not Lyd, Lim was a wartime at, on top of the cliffs. Mm. Uh, and they used to take a, a Bristol freighter. Now this was a 747 of Propeller World. And the front used to drop down, you put your car on it, and for seven and sixpence you could take it to Le Bourget. Uh, and that was quite an amazing thing. So I used to go down there on my bike, I'd go and see all the aircraft and mm. I used to say to the guy, can I have a flight? What do I do to have a little flight in this aircraft? And I think in the end, to get rid of me, they put me in the back seat of a Tiger Moth. I think it was a back seat. But it's open, open cockpit. Yeah. I think they took me over to about a thousand feet and turned me upside down and I realised I'm just being held in here with some material. <laughs> and to me, I loved it. So that was a highlight because running away from home, as it were, to go to sea, got me onto this travel thing and crossing the Atlantic commercially for the first time in 1958. But certainly going into a tiger moth and a bit, a bit daredevilish, if you will, but exciting. So these are highlights. Flying on Concord, the first flight. Flying uh, on certain aircraft, I mean, when I walked on Concorde, I could stand up in it. Obviously, it was quite narrow, but, it, but they contoured the seat. So I'm six foot two, I could stretch out, and the seats were comfortable. But then you're only in them three and a half hours. The problem with Concorde, everybody who 
wanted to be recognised. They stood in the Concord lineup for a long time. They wanted everybody to see where they were. <laughs> but the, the whole experience probably didn't last long enough. Yes, yeah. It was too short. You wanted yeah. it to go on and on and on, yeah? <laughs> so Concord, and then uh, walking on the 747 on its first flight out of Paris I was on, or into Paris in 1968 or something like that, um, walking on this theatre that flew. How did this get in the air? But it was an amazing aircraft, the 747, and it was around for so many generations. And I loved it, and especially when you go upstairs, when they started off, it was too close, but when they started off business class, it went there and upstairs. You like being on a private plane. Amazing. There wasn't much room for bags of stuff, that, no, you know, no. but, but it yeah. was an experience. So, many, so it, many highs. It, aren't it, well, it can go on again. Yeah. <laughs> if you keep, and you keep reminding me of things that uh, keep coming back, you yeah. know. You have an incredible memory. How do you keep your memory sharp? I know you've kept a log of all of the fl most <laughs> of the flights that you've taken, well, and, but how do you keep your memory sharp? I suppose. I have to thank people like you for that, because <laughs> I do a lot of interviews. Yes. And I do a lot of written stuff as well. Mm. And I have eight million followers uh, on what I write. Eight million, everyone. Yeah, it is, actually. Eight and, and it's probably nearer to nine now. Yes. But it's, it's because it comes under my byline of the world's most travelled person, I think people probably like to read it. Yes. I do tell the truth. And... I suspect that's why people read it. And, uh, and I, I used to write on TripAdvisor. I was a number one on TripAdvisor. But TripAdvisor owned by a travel company. Mm. Uh, and so to me, I didn't like it was biased. So I, yeah, you wanted to be independent. I, I, I wanted to be a d depart from yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so the knowledge is that every time I do a talk, there's a question and answer. Mm. And like you are kindly asking me questions, it jogs the memory. Yeah. For that, I, I, I'm sharp. Mm. And I can remember, everybody said my memory is good. But it wouldn't be good unless I had a person like you to take it out of me. Mm. And so it needs somebody, when I do an interview with a person who knows about travel and asks the right questions, probing or not, personal or not, I don't mind. Mm. But it, Brings it out. Yeah, brilliant. And you've got a book, haven't you, that you're in the process of writing your book yes, at the moment. Yes, it's, it's so about gonna done. Be, it's going to be out at the back end of the year. I, I'm hoping, well, it's we now it, with, a, it, with a ghostwriter. It, 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 I did all the material. You met my yes. guy last night, Paul yes. Evans. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't commercial. But again, I have to go back. I couldn't remember all the, all the details that we got. Mm. But Paul and I, he asked me, a couple of hours a day, sometimes every other day, and I'd fire off. I never stay on the same subject. You probably notice this, <laughs> but it, it's because I thought of something, and if I don't say it now, I will forget about it. Yes. So yeah. and I'm all over the place. Yeah. But he got it all down and put it in a chronological order. That was brilliant. Yeah. And without him, I couldn't have done it. No. Um, and so now there's a package, and, and our mutual friend Rinella took it to this mm. very wor worthwhile travel ghostwriter. Yeah. And he's put it all into order. And he said the f material of Fred's member memory is good. We just need to ascertain with the date. Mm. Because, for example, I was held a hostage in Tehran during a revolution. A, because my girlfriend at the time was the, flew with the Shah. And I took the Shah's children with her on a Ryanair private flight to Disney World and they closed it for half a day. So we took the Shah's ch children out a long time ago. Yeah. But because of uh, the, the, my closeness to people there and the amount of time I worked in, I had an office, it was right, right opposite the American Embassy. And uh, my friend Bob Ferguson, who was a catering director for British Airways at the time, he then became the catering director of Emirates later. We both got locked in prison overnight, and then they put us under house arrest. Wow. And, well, we didn't know what else to do, so we brewed beer. Probably the quarters would have been in a lot of trouble, but there we go. Oh, my gosh. And then in the end, they took us out. 
Um, we had to go through this customs and the Revolutionary Guard that inspected us. And I went to the last thing in the British Embassy there, for the Queen's birthday probably. And uh, they said, you can go shopping. Do you know it would take any money, any cheque? And I, I cashed a cheque for, for some stuff there. And they cashed it in New York before I got back in the same or next day. But I bought a few rugs. This is after you've been held hostage? Yeah. <laughs> so you've held hostage and then you go and buy a few rugs? Well, this is right, because it, it, we thought we got to get something out of it. But we, we, I was worried... That, the guy searching me, just look at here, and, and I'm worried about the guy behind, perhaps could see what I actually had. Yeah. But we got through. Wow. And when, when we flew out to Tehran airspace, you know, we went for, for people said, how, how much is different in the clock is it now? I said, about 2,000 years, you know, we've gone back. And uh, yes, it was quite an experience. Gosh. And then, you know, I, I went back to in, doing the revolution. I wanted to find our machinery and where it was, and we, we got it all sorted out. I took a guy with me from England who volunteered to come, Brian, and uh, it was from Leeds, and it was our engineer in, in the UK. And uh, we found it, and then we're in our office, and there was a demonstration going on that women burned Carter and this and that and the other. And the guys in the embassy saw me filming it. So they sent the two guys across and they said, we want your camera. I said, no, you can't have my camera. You're not allowed to, f no. I said, no, let's be fair. I'm not allowed to film at the airport. This is not the airport, is it? No. I said, well, they took me across to this guy and he asked me, what, I said, I'm just filming it. He said, I'm filming the embassy, are you? I said, no, I said, not at all. Ah. He said, you can go back. I said, you have to take me. I'm not walking back through this crazy women. You must be joking. <laughs> but he was the guy that later became president. Amazing. And wow. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was the guy that, he was the head of the Revolutionary Guards. It's, it's, I can't, the name's on the tip of my tongue. Mm. But, yeah. The, the, but I was honest. And I look people in the eye and be honest, you know. And so, mm. okay. And they did take me back. Amazing. But I would, I didn't, I've never been back since. No. Well, I'm not surprised. But, uh, you, there was so much baggage stacked in that bloody place. I expect it's still there. People didn't know where it was. They didn't Gosh. know anything about it. And my friend from Pan Am became the manager there. And he was, he was at, Pan Am's uh, t terminal in New York. And I, well, I, I flew back on Pan Am one day. Good story. And the guy, Ron Bride, that ran Pan Am in uh, the airport, because he liked cricket, and he wanted me to play cricket for Weybridge. And he never forgot what I was a cricket until we actually started to talk about it. So he, he saw me off, and he said, you know, there's a couple of lobsters on there today. They're not on the menu. He said, would you like them? So he told the flight attendant, the two lobsters for Mr. Finney's in 5J. So 5J is on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. So eventually it came round to me, and she said, what are you having for lunch? I said, there's a couple of, oh, they're gone. I said, where are they gone? She said, well, that lady and her eight-year-old son. I said, you gave my lobster to an eight-year-old? I said, you're kidding me. <laughs> she said, you can't talk to me like that. So I'm going to get the captain to you. So the captain came down. He said, can I see your ticket? I said, no. My ticket's none of your concern. I'm on the manifest. And that's, that's all I'm going to tell you. Oh, he said, well, he said, you can't just behave like this. I said, well, I was told by your manager, your director even, on the ground that this was for me. And I'd like it because it was promised. And it wasn't on the menu. So how did they, these people know about it? Anyway, cut a long story short, I got a, a phone call three days later from the president of the Pan Am. And he said, you'd better come and have breakfast with me. So I'm at the Pan Am building having breakfast at Penn. He said, you know, there's been a complaint about you. And he said, he said that you fly so much with us, they think you're staff. And they wonder how 
you could demonstrate that you should have a lobster as a staff member. <laughs> so he said, what we're doing in the next three days, we've got all our crew members coming to the uh, Hilton Centre. And he said, I'd like you to come and sit at the table with me so everybody will know who you are. So I did. Wow. And you always had lobster after that, did you? No, but, uh, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't about the lobster, really. <laughs> it, it, it was about, the, 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 you know, I was, was looking cool. for, I, I didn't care. No. <laughs> but I just fancied that lobster that day because it would have been promised. It's like, it's like a kid with a toy. You give him a toy and take it yeah, away, right? Yeah. So it was about all it was, and I had a little rant. Oh, bless but, you. But, uh, you're entitled to a little rant now and then. Well, you, you have to put the world right sometimes because it's a strange place the world we live in today Can to what we, what we grew up in, isn't it? And let's talk about putting the world right because I, I know you've had a long-standing relationship with BA for yes, all I do. these years. Um, and when we were talking before we started recording, you've got an ongoing discussion with BA, haven't you? Around yeah, the discussion your situation. is... Yes. So, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I will. Yes, I'm, I have been a long-standing supporter of British Airways and they've used me, still to, still to this day, when Concord comes on, it's usually I'm, I'm featured in it. When they had a problem at Terminal 5, they called me and I d did a walkthrough with them. Even with Terminal 4, they took me there before it opened and I told them the carousel was too small. Mm. They said, no, no, no. I said, believe you me, I, I, I'm used to carousels. Yep. It's smaller than the one in Terminal 3. <laughs> Can't be. It turns out it was. Mm. But that was Howard Phelps was a commercial director then of British Airways, an absolute gent. And I said to him, the service on your flight to Cairo, first class is rubbish. It, it's, the staff are not trained, the fruit ball's not there. There's lots of, so Terry Lakin, the fleet manager, flew with me. As a, I was guested then. And we had a, quite a nice party in Cairo anyway. <laughs> but then he wrote up the whole report and that Mr. Finn was quite right, and we should do this, and it's about training, and da 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 So I was used for that. Yes. And uh, Terminal 5, I did an interview for them, and it went on BA News, and it went in the press, and it was quite good for them. And I think I was going down to get married or something at, at this point. It was quite a long, whenever Terminal 5 opened. Yeah, it was a long time ago now, yes. And uh, so it was used. So anyway, going back to 1984, British Airways used me quite a lot with Concord, and Brian Walpole, who was the fleet director, in fact, Brian Walpole was the captain that kept Concord in the air. I'll just diversify for a second, it's worth a bet. He was told by Lord King that the plane was losing 50 million, and he needed to make a profit and Brian Walpole, Captain Walpole, you put your money where your mouth is, you've got two and a half years to make it, or we'll cancel it. So Brian went around, and they, of course the passengers, normal passengers, probably never knew what the ticket cost because the PA did it for them, right? Mm. So they asked everybody what they thought the seat was worth. And it was about double what they thought, yeah? what they were actually paying. Mm. So British Airways said, well, let's tell them, look at the value they got. I said, no, let's not tell them, let's just charge them. And he turned it around in two and a half years, to wait, 50 million a year profit. Yeah, great. So all this is the stuff that I was involved in. Yes. So they, they said to me, we can't employ you because you'd lose your value. So what we'll do is we'll make available for you and your family space available tickets per year open-ended because we know you're too busy and and you should you can just take them whenever you want yeah. it doesn't matter if they build up eventually i took a there was concord of first class I, I used them so they actually activated the system mm. and when i came back here i called up for a couple of tickets and they said yeah no problem and i went to new york and i went to two to the seychelles and a couple of first classes to nairobi and then a change of management, and Willie Walsh came. And uh, they said, well, we're not honouring this because the man has left the, the company. So they took everything away I had. But when they opened T5, I, I, they took me to the Concord Lounge and filled me in it. Mm. And they put some Concord seats there in the business centre. And they sat me in it, of course, mm. and made a big to-do about it. And so... 
They said, well, that captain, that person left it, and we, we don't recognise it. I said, but it's an agreement. I said, what happens if that same captain bought several aircraft? Would that have gone by the wayside as well? I said, I can't believe they're doing this. So through progressive people, it hasn't happened. And, and I don't have an executive card with British Airways, nothing. And people say to me, where is it? And they, they, they write remarks about it in my logbook, you know. Mm. I, they can't understand it at all. Fortunately for me, I know somebody, usually on the flight. And they, or they know somebody that knows somebody. Mm. And I'm, I'm looked after. But it's not the way forward. And they, they say, well, we don't do space available tickets anymore. I said, I know that. That's why you gave me guest of British Airways the last time. Mm. Yes, but, we, we, but it's too old, your agreement. I said, well... I can't help it. I lived a long time, can I? You know, I mean, it's the way, but something's got to break because I can't go keep flying around without an executive card. And I am your most frequent flyer. They know this. They've honoured me with receptions. Yes, yeah. And, and, and on my P&R, they can't take away what I've done. Mm. And they gave me oil painting for my 600 flight and stuff. So it's not that they can take it away. Mm. And I don't want to fight with them, but I want what is justifiably mine, and I want to travel in the style that I should be allowed. Mm. So where we're at right now is they owe me about 30 first class tickets. So they can either give me the tickets, I'll take them on a guest of business area, space available, I don't care. If they don't want to do that, they certainly won't give me the cash value. But the real value of those tickets is 3 million miles with Concord, which is 12 million points. Yeah. Another 8 million at triple points, that's 24, mm -hmm. plus 12 is 36 million points. Mm -hmm. They can put down a card for me and I'll never have to bother them again. Yes. And it costs them nothing to put it on a card for me. Nothing. So this is where we're at. I'd like to, to honestly get this settled. I haven't bothered anybody during the pandemic because I think it would be unfair. They've got plenty, and, and I'm really not an enemy of theirs. No, of I mean, course. I, I want it to work and I want them to come up with a solution. They were very happy to do a, a photo shoot at Concord for my 80th birthday, which we, we couldn't. So they did it last year for my 81st, a photo shoot with a Concord at, the, at, the, at Heathrow. And I asked them why it couldn't be moved inside or something. Well, because there's an, a rare owl nesting in it and we can't, are not allowed to touch it. Can't make this up, can you? Wow. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful now with this new CEO. And I, I mean, Colin Marshall, Roy Watts before him, I had carried a letter with me. And it said, this is to introduce Fred Finn to all British Airways staff worldwide. He's flown this and this and this. Please help him whatever he needs. I took that to Concord Lounge. After I'd done the thing for Terminal 5, well, he's left the company. I said, Colin Marshall, yes, he has, yes, he's, he's retired. But does that change the status of what it says? Oh, yes, he's not here, we can't, we can't, and you can't stay in here unless you're invited. Mm. So, and then one little short-ass guy said to me, he said, look, he said, I don't get anything free for shopping at Tesco. I said, but do you stand in front of Tesco and re appear on the most travel, published magazine in history. Are you in the Guinness Book of Records for shopping at Tesco? I said, I'm not trying to be clever, but this is what this is all about. Yeah. He said, if you're looking for trouble, I'll have you thrown out. I said, well, that might be your worst nightmare. So why don't you try and do that? I said, but you know, you're what you are, Derek. I said, I can't be bothered with you. And I'm going to walk away this time, but I was going to remember your name. And it's in the book. Yeah. His name as well. Okay. <coughs> so we'll see. So fingers crossed you get it resolved. That's what we want, isn't it? Well, I hope, I hope so, because yeah, it, it should be so. resolved in a friendly way. Absolutely. How much longer am I going to be travelling around? I'm 82 in six weeks' time. Even if I live for nine more years, I'm not going to keep this travel up as much as, I, as I've done previously. It just isn't going to be possible. Mm. So what's it actually going to cost them to treat me like a human being after all I've done for them? Absolutely, absolutely. That's all I'm asking. Isn't it? It's not, not, not anything particularly. No. I mean, other people do things. Other airlines seem to get all sorts of freebies. I'm not looking for a freebie. 
They tell me you, you can't have free tickets. We don't do. I said these are not free. You've earned these. They're, they're a barter <laughs> arrangement. That I'm entitled to. Exactly, exactly. So we'll see. Well, fingers crossed. I'm confident you're gonna. It's going to get resolved. Positive. I, I, positive I've got the right thing. attitude about I it again so. because I'm not bullying them. I'm not shouting up and down or jumping about. I just want it to be settled. And okay. you know, I hope that, I hope to hear this podcast because it's a nice way to talk. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I wanted us to cover it. Cause no, it absolutely. I it As I good. said, I'm, I'm open for questions. No, there's no secrets. No. Um, good. Happy I am. You are a very happy person. So I'm going to ask you a couple of final questions. Go ahead. If I can. So when you look back, can you think of the best piece of advice you've ever received, Fred? Because it's, uh, it's, probably a, it's probably you've had loads, but is there anything that stands out for you? Yes, don't let the bastards grind you down. <laughs> Nearly choked on my water. <laughs> Brilliant advice. Because it's true. Yeah. I know the language is a bit strong. It's all right. But you can use another word if you want. <laughs> Not at all. But you shouldn't be bullied. You know, I met people that helped me along in my career. I met people, so many people are jealous of me in my career. I mean, I, I, I was doing a a contract in in the I got fed up I had a permanent suite at the Intercontinental for many years and I got fed up with it. I'd come in late and I'd go back in the next morning. So I started to stay at the airport, which was convenient for me. If I wanted to go in London I could get a car to take me. But one night, Sunday night, uh or was it Thursday either Friday night, probably Friday night, and I'm having a business meeting and knock on the door and there's some scruffy guys there and a duty manager at the hotel said, they're the police, they've come to arrest you. I said, what's that for? They said, you haven't paid your bill. I said, are you the manager? Am I, am I, how are you bringing the police to my room? Uh, you, you know, my bill is paid. So they took me to Heathrow Police Station. And I, I, used, to, I used to work for the biggest law firm in London and uh, I called up the guy I worked with and, and he thought I was joking. It was at dinner and he said, I don't, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't let me make a phone call to start with. And then the sergeant said, okay. So then they called him back. I said, I'm not bloody joking, you know. So they put me in the cell with all the drug addicts, you know, and oh Christ, it was bloody a, a living nightmare. And in the morning, they, they covered the clock up, they were interviewing me, why haven't you paid your bill? And I said, I have paid my bill, why would I be staying there? And I said to the guy from EJ Arnold's in Leeds, I said, you make sure you get hold of this guy for me, because this is serious now. And uh, anyway, they, they, he left me a message, I, I now will be there in the morning. Because they said, well, you'll be here till Monday. I said, <laughs> I'll be on Concord out tomorrow morning, friend. You want to wait and see? Anyway, they covered the clock over there when they were talking to me. Anyway, about seven o'clock in the morning, the MP for, Uxbr for Uxbridge, they had a Heathrow and my barrister came. And they said, we want to know now why he's been in jail and we're going to report this to Q Division and somebody's going to lose their jobs. And the MP said, yes, definitely. Anyway, there was a lot of about a mistake and they were very sorry and all this. They said, are you going to press charges? I said, ah, I'm not because I can't have the time to keep coming back here. They took press with silly idiots. Mm -hmm. But what it was, there was a, a security guy at the hotel who reported me because he wanted my job. He'd actually written to my chairman to say, there's no, good, you could need to send Fred Finn here all the time. I can do the job for you on the ground. So my chairman said, what do you want? Uh, he said, go handle it. And I said, you know, I might have given you a job, but now I can't because I couldn't trust you. Mm. If I can't trust you, you can't work for me. And so this is what the guy did in return. Wow. Well, I, I, had, I had him changing my PNR. I got a check in, they said, you cancelled your flight. I said, I never cancelled any flight. And Amazing. One time, they'd asked me if I'd bring somebody important to a reception in New York when Concord came in. 
I thought, I'll bring my bank president, Bill Pill, because he was a fleet air and pilot. So I go to check in at Heathrow, and they said, you're late. I said, not according to my ticket. They said, well, it's pushed back. I said, I have to be on the flight because I've got a dignitary me I'm meeting and then I have to go to Pittsburgh for a lunch with Concord. Oh, so they call and it's John Cook. Who is it? Fred. Oh, Fred, tell him to leave his case for the 747 and tell him to bloody run. We'll <laughs> wait for him. They're on the tarmac, yeah? They've pushed back, they were ready wow. to go. Wow. And another guy said to me, can I come with you? I said, if you can keep up, come on. So actually I didn't see him again. So I, they fast tracked me through. There was a, a, a truck with a ladder that came on it. Mm. The engine was running. My hearing never been the same since. <laughs> and I run up the ladder and pop, 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 bare head jump. And I'm like this till we get to New York. But I made it. And Bill was there. We had a nice reception and we flew up to Pittsburgh with, with Norman Britton in the, the photograph. And we did three flybys, uh, one with the, two with the wheels down, one with the wheels up, and with no fuel in it, it was like a fighter. And there was a few, it was a bit queasy, should we say. <laughs> Then we had lunch and flew back to New York in time for me to go into customs and find my bag because the 747 had just landed. And I met this guy and he said, so you didn't make it either? I said, yeah, this is what I've just done. And that was what you could do with Concord. Amazing, amazing. It was. Gosh. So these, these are highlights. But there's, when, when you think up, now I'm going to be stupid. The biggest highlight of my current life is waking up every morning because I'm 82 in six weeks time so I'm too old to have a long illness so there's going to be a day when I don't wake up in the morning and I'm prepared for that mentally you know I know I'm not going I'm not going to be going on forever mm. so I, I'm not refusing to do anything I'm living and running so when I wake up in the morning, I've got a big smile on my face and people say, why? And Because uh, I, I woke up. Yeah. So it's a big highlight for me that I woke up every morning. Now that's a, a bit, it's not, it's meant to be what I feel. Um, it's about me. And I, I do feel good when I wake up in the morning. I, I really do. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, you can see that. You can yeah, see I'm a happy that. bunny. So this podcast, Fred, is called Brave, Bold, Brilliant. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Well, I think you've got to be brave to be on it because you're a very searching questionnaire, even, even interviewer, even in the nicest possible way. Nobody's going to escape you. <laughs> and nor should they if you, you've taken the time to research them and bring them onto your programme. They should be brave. Bold? Bold is, a, yes, I think if I wasn't bold, I couldn't have done perhaps what I have done. Mm. Perhaps bold and cheeky might fit a bit better sometimes, <laughs> yeah, because I know I'm cheeky. And brave, in circumstances I've been where I've been held as a terrorist, I've been locked up at Heathrow uh, uh, without, without reason. You have to be brave because you think you're going to get out of it. And I've landed uh, with the wheels up. I landed with the wheels up at, at Kennedy and nobody I knew I was on the flight. So if I'd have perished, nobody would know who I was. Because I was supposed to fly on Pan Am and the guy, there was a guy called Whitwaterhouse that ran Pan Am, who was a super guy. And Pan Am was full. In one case, I went to Frankfurt to get on a flight that came through, because they had an arrangement with British Airways. When they flew the 747, they wouldn't pick up any more than the 707. And I flew on to Frankfurt so I could dodge that sometimes, yeah? but. This time, he said, we're going to do a pull-through. I never know what the word pull-through meant with it, but it meant that he got me first class on Air India without a ticket. And there was a big problem with the wheels. So when you fall off a horse, you get back on it. So I'd flown in to meet my chairman the next morning, so I went round to the next desk when I got through everything eventually. I said, Where, where's your flight? They said, Go and I'll take it. So I flew to Copenhagen. And we'd circled New York for about an hour. I said to the flight attendant, why are we circling New York in a, a, like this? She said, there was a problem. I said, no, not for an hour. I said, we're burning fuel. We'd have either gone back or gone on. I said, is there a bomb? 
there's a, as you said, there's a suspected bomb, and I think they're going to clear it. I said, okay. So that was that. Um, and off we went, and I found my chairman. He said, what time will you be? And I said, well, probably tomorrow. Uh, and I told him what had happened. And I think he was used to me doing these zany things, you know, by now. And on another occasion, I was going to meet my wife. I'd flown, she'd, she'd flown in from New York, and she was in, uh, where was it, Berlin? No, Hamburg, Hamburg. 1977, I think it was, something around there. And uh, the British Airways flight I took landed away from the gate. And after about an hour, they said, we're still waiting for a gate. I said, but where is all these tanks and troops around here? What are the, I've never had this sort of welcome before. And she, she said, well I, well, I don't know. But the doors opened, guys ran out from everywhere, grabbed two guys in the seat, put guns at the head and marched them off. And instead of getting dinner at 7.30, I showed up at the hotel at 2 o'clock in the morning and she didn't believe a word I said, perhaps it was my ex-wife, but in the morning it was in the paper. So yes, uh, but I think I've said it before, 80 years, you know, if, if, you, if cars were built like aircraft, you could hand it down for 10 generations, it, that's as good as, good as it is about mm. flying. So 80 years you can fly without incident, now I think up to 100 years, so people really like to fly with me because nothing's going to happen for the next 300 years. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. The, 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 the stories are based on facts, yeah? I'm now, I suppose, an official storyteller. Mm. People invite me to dinners because I tell stories. But conversation revives a memory. But my friend Robert McNeil in, in Kiev, he said, we're going to have the best storyteller to dinner. And, and I, then I did a talk for him at his company, and he said, you, you talked about things that you never repeated. And you talked to Paul last night. He said, I found out things about Fred I never knew. Yes, yeah. So it's just that people jud regurgitate your memory. Yeah, yeah. And it's all there, really. It only needs fetching out. It's amazing. And uh, honestly, we've, we've covered so much and so many incredible stories. It feels a real honour, a real privilege to be well, able to chat both, with honestly. you. Well, it's both, honestly. I couldn't is. have done it without you. Yeah. And I, I don't mean it's not like anybody could do it. You, you're, you're familiar with the travel. You're utterly professional. And you can interview me in the best possible way. Oh. And I've enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed it. Oh. I mean, I, listen, I don't have to bullshit with you. First off, I'm too old. That's why I'm too old to remember bullshit. <laughs> um, but it's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure. I'm loving it. Oh, and we must you. do it when I want to have fun with you in the nicest possible way. I'm enjoying you. And why shouldn't I? Absolutely. You're no. beautiful, you're gorgeous, you're friendly. You're delightful to talk to. You're an absolutely amazing person. And you ask me this in two years' time, I'll tell you the same thing that I said today. It's not, I don't do compliments. Com oh, I'm so pleased to see you again, how nice you are. What <laughs> bullshit is that? But the girls I met last night, we were delighted to see each other. And I was getting so many Welsh cuddles that night. I mean... A kutch. Uh, they call it a kutch in Welsh. Oh, do they? Cuddle is a kutch. Yes. It's amazing, isn't it? I know. It's amazing. amazing. And the friendliness of the Welsh, it really, it, honestly. And, and I just want to close by saying a, re a big thank you to Martin, actually, Martin Morgan, because we've, you know, they've hosted you here in Morgan's. We've done the, the, the podcast here in Morgan's. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, um, you know, Martin is, uh, he's a close friend, but he's also, he's, you will get to meet him, um, I'm sure, one day. But yeah, big shout out to Martin and, and the whole oh, team. Oh, absolutely. So, this this hotel you. has been so kind. Yeah. I mean, I got such a... I was going to say a Welsh welcome, but no, I got, I got better than a Welsh welcome. I got a welcome that is unmatched. <laughs> From the minute I walked in the door, to, I met Kate, and uh, we went to a, a, a DVL a dinner last night. But the room, the service, it's, it's, old, it's old world. Well, the building is old world. Restored old world. Heritage old world. So... The attitude, 
and the welcome was old world because I think that sort of welcome is inbred. I don't think you can train people to do it. It's mm. there to you to polish up, but I, I think you have to have it to start with. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Morgan's um, Hotel for me has been an, an absolute pleasure. And now we're here in another hotel, basically, a small hotel, I guess it is, which is something special. Yeah, beautiful. It's not even open yet, so I'm sitting here doing it in a hotel. <laughs> it's not. I do things that I've driven along the interstate from New Orleans to to Miami, following a guy on an interstate that wasn't open, but he know where the bridges wouldn't completely went down and up. Well, I don't know. We'd get probably a lot of trouble if we get caught, but. Yes, you do do things, don't <laughs> so you? So always a first, always a first with Fred Finn. Oh, no. But um, yeah, no, honestly, massive thank you, Fred. Really God appreciate bless you. it's it. Been a pleasure. And, um, yes, you are brave, bold, and brilliant. Of course. I hope. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Without a doubt. I hope. I, 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 I've enjoyed your program. Brave, bold, and brilliant is a wonderful title. Um, I, I've enjoyed it. Good. I've really, really enjoyed it. I want to do more. You Excellent. Know? I, 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 I feel good. Watch this space. Well, thank you, Fred. It's been fabulous. Thank you very, very much. Big kiss to you as well. See you soon.